It is fascinating that an increasingly large number of people in the United States have become interested in the practice of what may generally be called meditation or contemplation according to models that have been followed for centuries in Asia. And one of the reasons for this is that the religions which are generic to the West, Judaism, Christianity, and even Islam, are more talkative than contemplative. In other words, when you go to a church service, if you're a Protestant, you expect the main event to be the sermon and also the minister's prayer offered uh, more or less spontaneously telling God how to control the universe. And if you're a Catholic, you expect the Mass which uh, has now been translated into English so that everybody can supposedly understand it and has thereby been degraded from what Hindus would call mantra, the use of sound for meditation, to a merely instructive affair. We are very verbose in our religion. And because of that, it's all words, words, words. And only rarely does this help us to transform our consciousness. And this is more and more people are realizing is the important thing. Because we discover this, that our extremely powerful technologies are magnifiers or amplifiers. When we do what we will, what we think we desire with technology, we are, as it were, blowing up our image of ourselves to enormous proportions. And many of us are beginning to realize that we don't like it. We discover ourselves to be beings that are hostile to the environment and that are bent on dominating it to the point of destruction. That we don't feel at home in the universe. We feel that our skin, at the very least, is a boundary between a palpitating, sensitive consciousness that's terrified of what's outside the skin and terrified of a good deal that's inside it, like bacteria and cancer cells, weak arteries, cholesterol, what have you. So we have this strange thing that Lancelot White called the European dissociation, the feeling of oneself as a prisoner, involuntarily so, in a hostile world that does not give a damn about our egos. And therefore, when news comes from all about, whether it be from the Orient or whether it be from experiments with psychedelic drugs, when news comes that this feeling of our own existence may be a hallucination, people prick up their ears and would like to know, is there some other mode of consciousness which one can be in, which is not this alienated mode? Because we feel, I think, many of us, very, very strongly, that if there is such a place, we would like to be there. That, of course, entails difficulties which we shall go into. But this is the starting point of the fascination for yoga, for zazen, and also for the Taoist forms of meditation, which are much less known. But there arise problems about this when we are going to convey these disciplines to Western people. Because Western people who are interested in things of this kind are apt to be very interested. Whereas on the other hand, in 
cultures where things of this kind have been known for thousands of years, there is a tendency for them to become rather rotish. And therefore, the way of teaching these disciplines, which many Asian teachers use, are designed not for mature adults, but for relatively young people who are not interested in learning them. In other words, when a kind of religion, let's take the case of Zen Buddhism, or in Chinese it is called Chan, when after some years pious people have followed these disciplines and uh, learned to enjoy them, they have a way of telling their children that you ought to enjoy this too. See? And we would like you to go to the monastery. And furthermore, when there's the superstitious feeling that raising a son to be a monk or a priest redounds to one's own good merit in future lives, the more sons you send into the priesthood, the better. It's the same in Catholic countries. It was the same among the British in the Anglican Church during the 18th century when the first son of the family went into the law because he had then a good chance of being a successful politician. The second son went into the army and the third son went into the priesthood. And it is a matter of course. And they had no real interest in religion. They weren't really curious. It was something they were studying out of filial duty to their parents. And especially in these days in Japan, when in order to inherit your father's temple, you have to go to the monastery and take Zen training. It becomes a matter of some urgency. So you have a lot of unwilling young men, sometimes young women, in the nunneries, learning the meditative disciplines under the supervision of ecclesiastical taskmasters who are everywhere in the world exactly the same. I attended from the ages of 13 to 17 an ecclesiastical boys boarding school in England. I can assure you I've had enough of it. <laughs> we were very sternly disciplined in the same way as uh, Zen monks are disciplined in Japan today. And it just strikes me as funny that uh, I have what I call the aching leg school of Zen, in which one sits in Zazen for an unnecessarily long time until one gets paralyzed. And then people come back from Japan or from anywhere and brag about how their legs hurt, as if it were some extremely esoteric discipline. And, you know, they bang them about with boards on the shoulders, and uh, like in England, they swipe them on the bottoms with canes. And it's all the same old story. And I think we need to go beyond this and develop a certain maturity towards the practice of meditation that is not based on all this boys' boarding school business. But it's very difficult to make people who have been brought up in that system see the point. Because they say, well, we got it this way, and that's the way you have to go in order to get it. So we have discussed this matter, and we feel that there can be an approach which does not insult the dignity of interested Western adults. Oh, some people love to have their dignity insulted because they think it's good for them, because it's going to subdue their egoistic pride. But nothing is more egoistic than the project of subduing your egoistic pride. We can read it straight out of Zhuangzi in the dialogue between <laughs> Lao Tzu and Confucius. Or, you know, it's an apocryphal dialogue. Zhuangzi was a great humorist. And he used the most outrageous stories and examples to illustrate his points. And so he put into the mouth of Confucius all sorts of things that Confucius would never have dreamed of saying. But he also arranges a dialogue between Lao Tzu and Confucius in which Confucius gets the wrong end of the stick. <laughs> Where Lao Tzu talks to him and asks him, what is your teaching? And he says it is charity and duty to one's neighbor and absence of self. 
Well, he says, sir, you are causing great disruption in the empire. Is not your elimination of self a positive manifestation of self? You are like somebody beating a drum in search of a fugitive. I mean, we would say, it is like the police about to raid a whorehouse with the sirens on, so that everybody hears them coming and runs away. You see? So in the same way, when you go after with the project to eliminate your selfishness, nothing could be more in the nature of spiritual pride. And you will work on it, and the more you work on it and get uptight and stiff, the more your spiritual bulge increases. <laughs> so in the Taoist doctrines, there is a principle called Wu Wei. And this means, Wu means non or not, no, negation, way, has a combination of meanings. It can mean action, making, but the best translation I have found for it is forcing. And so Wu Wei is the principle of not forcing in anything that you do. Now we know when we watch any performance of an artist, be it a dancer or a, an actor or a musician, we know immediately when the performance is forced. And we say it doesn't ring true, it's too artificial, it doesn't seem to be natural. Many people who study the Taoist doctrines think that Wu Wei means do nothing, in the sense of laissez-faire, be lazy, always be passive. It doesn't mean that. There is a time for action. When you study judo, you use muscle only at the right moment. When your opponent is hopelessly overextended and off balance, and you add a little muscle to it and you throw him across the room, but only then, you never use muscle at the wrong moment. For as Shakespeare knew perfectly well, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at its flood leads on to fortune. And so Wu Wei is based on knowledge of the tide. The drift of things. Get with it. Wu Wei is the art of sailing rather than the art of rowing. So, if you say now, one of the most famous sayings of Lao, in the Lao Tzu book is superior virtue has no intention to be virtuous and thus is virtue. Inferior virtue cannot let go of virtuosity and thus is not virtue. So one could also say, the real Wu Wei is not intentionally Wu Wei, and so is Wu Wei. But inferior Wu Wei so tries to be Wu Wei that it isn't. In other words, this is saying Wu Wei is not a matter of cultivated passivity or even of cultivated spontaneity. Because there are people who think that they are released. That they have realized that they are the Tao, as all of us in fact are, or that you are, to put it into Vedanta terms, every one of us is the Brahman. The eternal self of the universe, beyond all description or classification or thought. And say, okay baby, I'm that, now I'm going to have a ball. <laughs> well, what kind of a ball do they have? Well, what they do is they look up the rules on which society runs and do the opposite. Well, that's still running by the rules of society. And it's a mirror image in reverse. That's not spontaneity. You have to be able to realize that you don't know what you really want to do. 
until you are very quiet. And it tells you. So, to quote Jesus, unless you become again as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you read the Bible, incidentally, which is a very dangerous book, as I'm going to be demonstrating in Playboy this December, uh, <laughs> but understand heaven in a very literal sense, space. See, we are in heaven now because the earth is a spaceship and heaven is space. What is called in Chinese, gung, Japanese, gu, the void. That's what is important. That we, most of us don't know this. Even Shakespeare has one of his characters saying, oh, that this all too solid flesh would melt. But do you know you are much more space than you are anything else? If the ponderable, I won't say matter, the ponderable whatever in your bodies were condensed and all put together, it would be smaller than the point of a pin. And anyway, somebody once said, even a bishop is 80% water. <laughs> <laughs> We are airy nothings. So space is somehow very, very fundamental. We go into this in further way. But we understand that heaven is space. And all those references in those nursery rhymes that we learned as children, which were the hymns, about heaven. Always we're talking about thrones and crowns and harps and streets of glass. Crystals. Transparencies. Space. It comes down to space always. Space which nobody can define, nobody can imagine, appears to be nothing, is the foundation of the universe. But you have to become again as a child to see that. Now, you know, go back to your childhood. What were the fascinating things? What's out there? What's beyond the stars? How long does it go on? And Mama said, it goes on always and always and always. The child wonders. He's excited that this is something that never ends. Then the child asks about time. How long ago is long ago? Well, the Bible says that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Well, what did God do before he did that? Well, as one person said, he sat up thinking punishments in hell for people who ask silly questions. <laughs> but still, that is only a joke. And the, 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 the child thinks of God going back and back and back forever, but never beginning. So in the same way you think about death, go to sleep and never wake up, never. <whistles> Why, it would be as if you never had existed, not only you, but everything else, which is, of course, the way things were before you were born. <laughs> you just turn it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how about, how about waking up after having never gone to sleep? That's quite a thought. There's something fishy about it all. Ichthys, Jesus Christos, theu, so here, the fish. So we get a funny feeling when we think those questions really through. Very funny feeling. 
And children, you see, love to get into that funny feeling. Children do all kinds of weird things. They like to spin around as fast as possible, so they watch the, suddenly the whole the ground goes tilting. They do this thing, giddy, 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 with their eyes, and they go, <laughs> and they make faces and test out their bodies in all sorts of funny ways. Because they know from the beginning that the world is weird. A strange thing. Because everybody knows what it's all about, only they won't admit it. Being brought up is being taught not to admit it. But you know very well what's going on. But in order to find out once more as an adult, you have to become again as a child. So what does that involve? It means, ladies and gentlemen, would you please check your ideas and opinions at the door? First of all, all your philosophical and religious views, all your logic, because I say check it at the door advisedly because you can pick it up again when you go out if you feel unsafe without it. I'm not trying to argue you out of your opinions and views. I'm merely suggesting that for the sake of an experiment, you temporarily suspend them. And view what is as if you didn't even know how to talk. Red is not red, blue is not blue. Hard is not hard, soft is not soft. Male is not male, female is not female. There is just this jazz. It will not be possible to compel yourselves into this way of looking at things because what Buddhists call habit energy is going on, 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 on. And as I talk to you, you will find yourselves thinking in a compulsive and habitual way this is red, this is green, this is something, this is nothing, this is solid, this is space. All right, but treat those thoughts that are going on in your head in exactly the same way as if they were... See? That's all they are. Like shapes in the spray as the sea breaks on the rocks. Now, please don't get agitated that this is an anti-intellectual point of view, that this is undermining the value of logic and reason and so on. Just, uh, we, we'll bring all that back later when we need it. But just for the time being, let's simplify. Close your eyes. Listen. What is? What do you really and truly, honestly, hear? Don't name it. Just as if it were music. Classical music. Can you hear the past? Can you hear the future? Can you hear the listener? Where do the sounds come from? Ears alone, please. Look, Mama, no hands. Let them tell you the truth. You may be talking to yourselves, 
Don't try to repress it, as I said. Just disregard it. That happens. It's like an itch. Really listen. Dig that sound. Now, that's the easiest way to begin into meditation. For most people. There are, we're all different, of course, and there are different things for different people's temperaments. But I find it simplest to illustrate it by hearing without comment so that you can get into tune with what is. You can't really get out of tune with it. But we don't know that yet. <laughs> Maybe some of you do. <laughs> the art of meditation is a way of getting into touch with reality. And the reason for it is that most civilized people are out of touch with reality because they confuse the world as it is with the world as they think about it and talk about it and describe it. For on the one hand there is the real world and on the other a whole system of symbols about that world which we have in our minds. These are very very useful symbols all civilization depends on them but like all good things, they have their disadvantages. And the principal disadvantage of symbols is that we confuse them with reality. Just as we confuse money with actual wealth. And our names about ourselves, our ideas of ourselves, our images of ourselves, with ourselves. Now, of course, reality from a philosopher's point of view, is a dangerous word. A philosopher will ask me, what do I mean by reality? Am I talking about the physical world of nature? Or am I talking about a spiritual world? Or what? And to that I have a very simple answer. When we talk about the material world, that is actually a philosophical concept. So in the same way, if I say that reality is spiritual, that's also a philosophical concept. And reality itself is not a concept. Reality is... And we won't give it a name. Now it's amazing what doesn't exist in the real world. For example, in the real world, there aren't any things, nor are there any events. That doesn't mean to say that the real world is a perfectly featureless blank. It means that it is a marvelous system of wiggles in which we descry things and events in the same way as we would project images on a Rorschach plot or pick out particular groups of stars in the sky and call them constellations, as if they were separate groups of stars. Well, they're groups of stars in the mind's eye, in our system of concepts. They are not out there as constellations already grouped in the sky. So in the same way, the difference between myself and all the rest of the universe is nothing more than an idea. It is not a real difference. And meditation is the way in which we come to feel our basic inseparability from the whole universe. And what that requires is that we shut up. That is to say that we become interiorly silent and cease from the interminable chatter that goes on inside our skulls. 
Because, you see, most of us think compulsively all the time. That is to say, we talk to ourselves. And I remember when I was a boy, we had a common saying, talking to yourself is the first sign of madness. Now, obviously, if I talk all the time, I don't hear what anyone else has to say. And so in exactly the same way, if I think all the time, that is to say, if I talk to myself all the time, I don't have anything to think about except thoughts. And therefore I'm living entirely in the world of symbols and I'm never in relationship with reality. All right, now that's the first basic reason for meditation. But there is another sense, and this is going to be a little bit more difficult to understand, why we could say that meditation doesn't have a reason or doesn't have a purpose. And in this respect, it's unlike almost all other things that we do, except perhaps making music and dancing. Because when we make music, we don't do it in order to reach a certain point, such as the end of the composition. If that were the purpose of music, to get to the end of the piece, then obviously the fastest players would be the best. And so likewise, when we are dancing, we are not aiming to arrive at a particular place on the floor, as we would be if we were taking a journey. When we dance, the journey itself is the point. When we play music, the playing itself is the point. And exactly the same thing is true in meditation. Meditation is the discovery that the point of life is always arrived at in the immediate moment. And therefore, if you meditate for an ulterior motive, that is to say, to improve your mind, to improve your character, to be more efficient in life, you've got your eye on the future and you are not meditating. Because the future is a concept. It doesn't exist. As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. There is no such thing as tomorrow. There never will be. Because time is always now. And that's one of the things we discover when we stop talking to ourselves and stop thinking, we find there is only a present, only an eternal now. So, it's funny then, isn't it, that one meditates for no reason at all, except we could say for the enjoyment of it. And here I would interpose the essential principle that meditation is supposed to be fun. It's not something you do as a grim duty. The trouble with religion as we know it is that it is so mixed up with grim duties. We do it because it's good for you. It's a kind of self-punishment. Well, meditation, when correctly done, has nothing to do with all that. It's a kind of digging the present. It's a kind of grooving with the eternal now. And brings us into a state of peace where we can understand that the point of life, the place where it's at, is simply here and now. Well now, in the art of meditation there are various props, supports. One thing that we are going to use as a means of stilling chatter in the mind is pure sound and for that reason it's useful to have a gong. This is a Japanese Buddhist gong made of bronze and shaped like a bowl. Or you can use your own voice chanting. Another prop in meditation is the use of incense. And that is because the sense of smell is our repressed sense. And because it's our repressed sense, it has a very powerful influence on us. And therefore we associate certain smells with certain states of mind. 
and so the smell of incense is associated with peace and contemplation, and so it's advantageous to burn incense in meditation. The other prop is a string of beads, and these beads are used in meditation for an unconscious method of timing yourself. Instead of looking at a watch, you move a bead each time you breathe in and out, so that at a certain rate, you see there are always 108 beads on a rosary, and when you get to slow breathing, halfway around the rosary is about 40 minutes, and that is the usual length of time for which one sits in meditation because otherwise you get uncomfortable and you get stiff legs and problems of that kind. Now then, the other thing, first of all, that we have to go into is how does one sit in meditation? You can sit any way you want. You can sit in a chair or you can sit like I'm sitting, which is the Japanese way of sitting, or you can sit in the lotus posture, which is more difficult, which is cross-legged with the feet on the thighs, soles upwards. And uh, the younger you start that in life, the easier you'll find it to do. Or you can just sit cross-legged on a raised cushion above the floor. Now the point of this is that if you keep your back erect, I don't mean stiff like this, nor slumped like this, but just easily erect, you are centered and easily balanced and you have a feeling of being thoroughly rooted to the ground. And that sort of physical stability is very important for the avoidance of distraction and generally feeling settled. Here and now, j'y suis, j'y reste, as the French say. I'm here and I'm going to stay. Well now, the easiest way to get into the meditative state is to begin by listening. If you simply close your eyes and allow yourself to hear all the sounds that are going on around you. Just listen to the general hum and buzz of the world as if you were listening to music. Don't try to identify the sounds you're hearing. Don't put names on them. Simply allow them to play with your eardrums. and let them go. In other words, you could put it, let your ears hear whatever they want to hear. Don't judge the sounds. There are no, as it were, proper sounds or improper sounds, and it doesn't matter if somebody coughs or sneezes or uh, drops something. It's all just sound. And if I am talking to you right now and you're doing this, I want you to listen to the sound of my voice just as if it were noise. Don't try to make any sense out of what I'm saying because your brain will take care of that automatically. You don't have to try to understand anything. Just listen to the sound. As you pursue that experiment, you will very naturally find that you can't help naming sounds, identifying them, that you will go on thinking, that is to say, talking to yourself inside your head automatically. But it's important that you don't try to repress those thoughts by forcing them out of your mind, because that will have precisely the same effect as if you were trying to smooth rough water with a flat iron. You're just going to disturb it all the more. What you do is this. As you hear sounds coming up in your head, thoughts, you simply listen to them as part of the general noise going on, 
just as you would be listening to the sound of my voice or just as you would be listening to cars going by or to birds chattering outside the window. So look at your own thoughts as just noises. And soon you will find that the so-called outside world and the so-called inside world come together. They are a happening. Your thoughts are a happening just like the sounds going on outside. And everything is simply a happening and all you're doing is watching it. Now in this process another thing that is happening that is very important is that you're breathing. And as you start meditation you allow your breath to run just as it wills. In other words, don't do at first any breathing exercise, but just watch your breath breathing the way it wants to breathe. And to notice a curious thing about this. You say in the ordinary way, I breathe, because you feel that breathing is something that you are doing voluntarily just in the same way as you might be walking or talking. But you will also notice that when you are not thinking about breathing your breathing goes on just the same. So the curious thing about breath is that it can be looked at both as a voluntary and an involuntary action. You can feel on the one hand I am doing it and on the other hand it is happening to me. And that is why breathing is a most important part of meditation because it is going to show you as you become aware of your breath that the hard and fast division that we make between what we do on the one hand and what happens to us on the other is arbitrary. So that as you watch your breathing you will become aware that both the voluntary and the involuntary aspects of your experience are all one happening. Now that may at first seem a little scary because you may think, well, am I just the puppet of a happening, the mere passive witness of something that's going on completely beyond my control? Or on the other hand, am I really doing everything that's going along. Well, if I were, I should be God. And that would be very embarrassing because I would be in charge of everything. That would be a terribly responsible position. The truth of the matter, as you will see it, is that both things are true. You can see it that everything is happening to you. And on the other hand, you're doing everything. For example, it's your eyes that are turning the sun into light. It's the nerve ends in your skin that are turning electric vibrations in the air into heat and temperature. It's your eardrums that are turning vibrations in the air into sound. And in that way, you are creating the world. But when we're not talking about it, when we're not philosophizing about it, then there is just this happening, this... Uh, and we won't give it a name. Now then, when you breathe for a while, just letting it happen, and not forcing it in any way, you will discover a curious thing that without making any effort you can breathe more and more deeply. In other words, supposing you simply are breathing out and breathing out is important because it's the breath of relaxation as when we say and heave a sigh of relief. So when you are breathing out you get the sensation that your breath is falling out. Dropping, dropping, dropping out 
with the same sort of feeling you have as if you were settling down into an extremely comfortable bed. And you just get as heavy as possible and let yourself go. And you let your breath go out in just that way. And when it's thoroughly comfortably out and it feels like coming back again, you don't pull it back in, you let it fall back in. Letting your lungs expand, 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 until they feel very comfortably full, and you wait a moment and let it stay there, and then, once again, you let it fall out. And so, in this way, you will discover that your breath gets quite naturally easier and easier, and slower and slower, and more and more powerful. So that with these various aids, listening to sound, listening to your own interior feelings and thoughts, just as if they were something going on, not something you are doing, but just happenings, and watching your breath as a happening that is neither voluntary nor involuntary, you are simply aware of these basic sensations. Then you begin to be in the state of meditation. But don't hurry anything. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about what progress you're making. Just be entirely content to be aware of what is. Don't be terribly selective, particular, say, I should think of this and not of that. Just watch whatever is happening. Now then, to make this somewhat easier, to have the mind free from discursive verbal thinking, sound or chanted sound is extremely useful. If you, for example, simply listen to the gong, And let that sound be the whole of your experience. It's quite simple. It requires no effort. And then along with that, especially if you don't have a gong, we can use what are called in the Sanskrit language mantra. Mantra are chanted sounds which are used not so much for their meaning as for the simple tone. And they go along with that easy kind of slow breath. Uh, one of the basic mantras is, of course, the sound om. That sound is used because if you spell it out, A-U-M, it runs from the back of your throat to your lips, and therefore it contains the whole range of the voice. And for that reason it represents the total energy of the universe. This word is called the pranava, the name for the ultimate reality, for the which than which there is no witcher. And so, in this way then, if you chant it, varied like this.
And you can keep that up for quite a long time. And eventually you will find, as you go on chanting, that the words of the chant will simply have become pure sound. And you won't be thinking about it. You won't have any images about the sound going on in your mind. You will simply become completely absorbed in sound. And therefore you will find yourself living in an eternal now in which there is no past and there is no future and there is no thing called difference between what you are as knower and what you are as the known, between yourself and the world of nature outside you. It all becomes one doing, one happening. Now, in addition to those slow-moving chants, you may find it, according to your temperament, easier to do a fast-moving one. These have a sort of rhythm to them that is absorbing. Say, a chant that many of you have heard that goes, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And it doesn't matter what it means. Actually, Krishna and Rama are the names of Hindu divinities. But that's not the point. The point is just to get with that thing that is running, running, running. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, and so on. And if you're a Christian or a Jew and you feel more inclined to use a meditation word that is more congenial to you, you can use, say, Alleluia, Alleluia. You can use the, the Allah, the name of God. They have a way of doing it, you know, which gets very exciting. Because, Allah, 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 and you'll be out of your mind. But you see, to go out of your mind at least once a day is tremendously important because by going out of your mind you come to your senses. And if you stay in your mind all the time, you are over-rational. In other words, you're like a very rigid bridge which because it has got no give, no craziness in it, is going to be blown down in the first hurricane. Just as you've been letting vibrations in the air play with your ears, let your lungs breathe as they will. Don't as yet attempt any breathing exercise. Don't force anything. Simply allow breathing. Now, is this breathing a voluntary or involuntary action? Or both? Or neither? Just feel it without taking sides, without words. And again, hear my voice as if it were wind in the trees or the sound of waves.
Most of us are short of breath. We never really empty our lungs. But to make a long, complete outbreath, you mustn't force it. Imagine there's a large ball of lead inside your neck and allow it to fall slowly through your body to the floor, pushing and easing the breath out as it drops. Ease the breath out just as you settle and sink down comfortably into a bed. And when the ball reaches the floor, let it drop away as if to the center of the earth. Then let the breath come back, back in, as a reflex, without pulling it. And then imagine another ball of lead in the neck. And again, let it fall out, long and easy. And once again. Now, do you see what's happening? You are generating a great deal of energy without trying or forcing. Two things seem to be happening at once. First, the outflow of breath is simply falling, happening all by itself. Second, it's under perfect control. So from this practice, you learn to experience to realize that what happens to you and what you do are one and the same process. There is no real separation between one thing called you and another quite different thing called the universe. When you stop talking and naming, they're quite obviously one. So again, let breath fall easily out. All the way. Let it come back on its own, and then out again. And now let's put the sound R on the next outflow.
and again so that you have nothing in mind but... Oh.